Welcome to School Talk. I'm Nadja Varney, your host. The world is changing. The information age has morphed into the digital technological age. And we're wondering, how are the colleges and universities coping? I'm delighted to welcome today Dr. Edmund Cabellan. He's a senior administrator and educator. He's the leader in student affairs, technology, and marketing at Bridgewater State University. Welcome, Dr. Cabellan. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're one of the people I need to talk to because you're on the cutting edge of the whole world changing. <laughs> now, before we talk about the issues, though, um, what got you so interested? I've watched videos. I've read things you've written. Um, how did you get so interested in this? I think it was my family. Um, you know, oh. growing up as the, yeah, the oldest immigrant son of, of two from the Philippines who came here in the early 70s, my dad was a mechanical engineer. So oh. technology was always, you know, sort of part of our family. We were the first to have computers and video game consoles, and I always was curious about the use of technology. And as an innovative thinker, I believe that <clears throat> the use of technology was going to be at the center of all of education's, you know, uh, evolutions and the things that would benefit our students and our educators and so to me it was a natural progression for me to continue exploring what what and how technology can play a role in our evolution as institutions of higher education elementary education etc well thank goodness that there are people who follow their interests into the world and do so much good as you have been um, but you know, in education, things don't usually change very fast. That's what's so interesting about this topic. I mean, they're still talking about how to test kids and what's the best way to do early childhood education. So uh, I'm going to just put this out to you. Why this sense of urgency that you seem to have about using digital technology, and especially at higher education? I think the world's moving at such a fast pace. We've seen it through many of the different changes over the last 10 years specifically as digital technology tools have taken shape. Um, you know, where if you really look at the evolution of it over the last 10 to 15 years, it is like a teenager. So it's going through these metamorphoses and changes and really growing pains in a lot of ways for how the old less contemporary thinking is now clashing with what students are demanding as part of their education. So the urgency really comes from the fact that A, if we're really preparing our students for a, a, you know, a work, work in the workplace and being able to compete for jobs that you know, a lot of our employers now are seeking those digital soft skills that folks are looking for to add to their um, you know, when they first walk into to a job, whether it's using the internet or looking at digital literacy and knowing what information is correct or using social media to communicate and market. Um, there's an expectation from employers as well that we educate them and prepare them properly. So from the elementary school system, you have this challenge. My wife's a school teacher and she always talks about infrastructure and how, you know, students are coming to class with cell phones, but yet the infrastructure for Wi-Fi in the school is aging and it's not really keeping up with what they need. Um, you know, they're asked to do things on iPads in specialty classrooms and then they go home and they may not have access to it. And so particularly in schools like Brock, the Brockton Public School Systems or some of the, some of the more urban school systems, it's, ch it's challenging to fund the technology expectations that our students have and yet keep up with the demands of the hardware, software, and all mm -hmm. the infrastructure. You know, it's funny because way back when, <laughs> date myself here, but when they first started talking about the internet, I remember, was it, uh, was it Al Gore or something? It was Al Gore. They were out there putting up wires, showing that they were really going to start. And I was thinking, this will probably all be obsolete very soon, you know? Sure. And here it is. It is obsolete. Well, you mentioned the elementary school and so forth, but how are we doing at the college and university level? And maybe you could give a few tips to some faculty members who may be watching this show mm -hmm. um, as to how they can get a little bit more with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's all to your point about change and slow in terms of the speed of change in higher ed. Mm -hmm. Faculty, when they arrive at an institution, if they have their pedagogy, their pedagogical approaches in mind, it's very difficult to shift and change to add technology. Mm -hmm. You know, you have it on the surface, right? You have things like learning management systems, such as ours, Blackboard here, here at Bridgewater State. Um, and some faculty are using it at a very cursory level. They're just using it to maybe put some things up on the internet for students to grab and take down. And others are using it really in innovative ways, whether it's including video, whether it's including tests and 
different um, game, you know, gamification of the education now through learning management. Some are using social media, but I think the the, pro the challenge is that we haven't caught up with the education as well. So you have this this need to meet students where they're at, and yet we haven't properly trained our you know our faculty and our staff really both of them to utilize these tools properly and the attitude of change saying well this still works why am I going to change the way I do things if we really care about students and really want to meet students where they're at and so at some point we're going to have to rethink our own processes whether it's administratively or whether it's in the, in the classroom to to find out what do our students need and us doing some shifting and not saying students are lazy or students demand way too much nowadays when in fact they have grown up in a world where this has become second nature. It has become part of who they are and so it's on us as educators to find that balance. Mm -hmm. and, and as you say it is difficult. I remember when they were here at Bridgewater putting up their first whiteboards or oh, white sure. smart boards and I know the people here at Mopi TV were very involved in doing that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matt was building a lot of the stations that they, you see in the rooms sure. that, from which they do all kinds of things. So I think you're right. When we hear people talking about nanotechnology and ro robotics and artificial intelligence, it makes some of us who, you know, we were in our prime a little while ago teaching, and it kind of is scary for, for the, you know, the instructors, the teachers themselves. But as you say, I think with training and encouragement, um, they're usually learners. Good teachers are constantly learning. So, mm -hmm. but you know, as you mentioned several times now at, at the uh, Brockton School or wherever it was, you said they didn't have Wi-Fi, even though the students had pad, iPads or whatever. And I, until recently, we had so many budget cuts for higher education mm. that I'm wondering, don't we need both money as well as the will to change? And so I'll put it this way. How can administrators mm. of universities and colleges, what's their role? How can they make this happen? Well, I think in part they have to, A, demonstrate some innovation with current technology. So something I see often with my colleagues in the administrative side of the house is that they're not using what's currently at the institution for them in, at the fullest potential. So they'll use a tool, they'll use an app, or they'll use some hardware that at a very elementary level, cursory, without really diving more deeply into how else could I use this, how could I use this cross-divisionally with colleagues. So I think we need to just examine the current technolo technological tools that Bridgewater offers, which is quite a bit. And the staff here do a lot with very little, and so to their credit. But then you also have to consider how else can we educate the staff and the faculty on what is available here. So there's that element. And then the second piece is looking at in budget planning, in strategic planning, in any kind of planning mm -hmm. exercise we go through as an yeah, institution, yeah. we have to think, well, how are we using technology in our work and what's missing? Have we asked students? Have we asked faculty and staff, you know, what else could we be doing with this? Because students often will give us that sort of missing link if we ask them, but we fail to include them in the process. We fail to ask them whether it's through online tools or whether it's through in-person, walking through the cafeteria saying, here's this new piece of tech or some piece, some new digital communication tool we could use. What do you think about that? That's interesting though. Could you give me an example? I'm, I'm just thinking of, uh, you know, a professor who may be using technology minimally, you know, putting up uh, for something for the student to read at home and yeah. comment on or uh, that kind of thing. W what kind of a thing might be something new that a student might come up with? Um, just some idea. What, what might be something that they might suggest to sure. the staff person? Sure. So something that we've developed in Student Affairs and Enrollment Management is our whole integrated marketing team and a new website called bsulife.com. And it was all, all recommended and really built from our students. Did you call that an en enrollment? And so it was a really an enrollment management tool. Oh. But it also engaged our commuter students and our, and our transfer students, two populations that really often get overlooked here exactly. at the institution. Yes. So, you know, students felt that the university's communication modalities really focused on externally facing audiences, like the website focuses on, you know, the community or prospective students or parents, but who is really communicating directly to our students um, through some digital tool? So we created a, an integrated marketing team within our division 
to purposely communicate with our students through social media and through our, through the website we created, bsulife.com, which is a completely different website, you know, off off the B, bridge bridgew.edu grid per se. It's separate. It is, and it's and it's dynamic. It's mobile friendly, and it was addressing some of the needs that our students had expressed through focus groups, through Such conversations. Yeah. Well, so the infrastructure for our websites, which isn't really new to our colleagues here at the Bridgewater State, you know, we're we have two we have two websites, an intranet, which is our internally facing website that's, mm -hmm. used, that's built using Microsoft SharePoint and then our externally facing website which is more really a marketing brochure type of website mm -hmm. um, that's built in a software called Drupal. Both were not as mobile friendly or mobile responsive because if you think of our students and the population that's going to consume all this information, they live on their phones. I know. So if the if oh. the if the messages and the material wasn't, you know, wasn't consumable on a mobile phone, then they're not going to really read it or be exactly. engaged with it. So they said, could we have something that's really more mobile friendly, more contemporary, and something that we can easily wow. share with our friends? And so we did that. We built that, and it's our, we're in our fourth year of, of doing so. You know, if folks want to know more about life, as being of life of a student, they go to bsulife.com and they can check it out. That, is, that sounds really innovative and coming from a student's recommendation. Yeah. I congratulate you or whoever was willing to listen to the students. Sure. This is so interesting to me because I do think we miss something when we're just lecturing at students. Agreed. From first grade on. When I had younger grades early on in my career, sure. people would say, well, why do you have the students talk about it? Why don't you just... And you know, once you have your mind tuned in, and some of these students have wonderful questions from, I mean, preschool, and you're a father, I am. so you know, I am, yeah. at home, and they go to school and just have to sit there sometimes and listen and then do a paper, mm -hmm. how boring and how lacking in bringing out the students, um, what they know and what they think. So this makes me very excited at the higher, glad you're here to be, <laughs> you know, stirring that pot. Yeah. Um, now, the other thing is you did mention the, the mobile phones and so forth, uh, but I'm wondering about this constant use of social media because I see so many of the kids, including mm. my own grandkids. Of course. They're, they're usually taking pictures of themselves or sending pictures or downloading a band um, and on Twitter or Facebook. And then this morning, blew my mind, I was showing this to you offset, right on the front page, mm -mm. how to spot a fake. Um, and they're trying to instruct students on how to tell real news from fake, fake news. And I think one of the researchers found that middle school children couldn't tell the difference between an ad and something that was, you know, just an article or so. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you want to just speak to that a little bit. Um, how, how would, what would you say the goal is for students at the higher, higher education level yeah. in um, bringing forth all of this digital technology. What are, you, what are you up to? What's your goal? Sure. You don't want them to just take pictures of themselves Absol all day. Absolutely <laughs> not. So there's two pieces to that. The first I would say is around the movement from social media to social networking. So back to the idea that the use of social media or social networking tools is meant to engage and create around communities. You know, And when you look at the way our um, our youth have grown up as they enter, if we're talking traditional age college students, ages 18 to 24, mm -hmm. which is really hard to say traditional nowadays because even I at Bridgewater, know. they're older, right? <laughs> and they're older. There's a mix, veterans so, and parents coming back. Absolutely. Right. And so now you have to consider how has social media Ad, you know, accelerated the development of our youth because now they have access to information that, you know, when I was back, you know, before the pre-social media days, I had to go to the library, look up, look, go into encyclopedias, card catalogs, and find that. But now they have it at the tip of their hand, tip of their fingers. So what we try and instill in our students here is that when they arrive at orientation, I do a session for them around digital technology and, and social media, and saying, look, you have come here with already a personal construct around how you use social media. What we're recommending is that you expand your use of social media to include professional and educational constructs. So who are you gonna use social networking to meet online to talk about a future career, find an internship, or share what you're writing about and learning about in school? How are you gonna create educational communities, whether it's through Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter, to advance your education outside the classroom? So we challenge our students, the ones that we come in contact with, to think about an expanded use of social media beyond the personal, because I think we get our biases around social media become a hindrance to the actual application of the tool, mm -hmm 
if all we think about are students doing selfies, we're missing the, uh, another two-thirds of the uses of social media for education and for professionalism. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. We need to take a break right now, but this is getting so exciting. Lots more questions about digital technology. We'll be right back. Michael Adams? Here. Michael Adams? Here. Michael Adams. Students who miss 18 days of school in any grade risk falling behind and not graduating. Absences add up. Dr. Cabellan, um, as we went off air for that little break, we were talking about um, the students coming in with high expectations uh, for digital technology and staff people and professors trying to adjust to it. But I'm thinking about some of the students who come in from poorer families and they may have more than one student coming from that family and they may not have the money to buy computers and all the kinds of gadgets that kids have now. Um, how do you deal with that? So what we do here at the university is we try and partner them up with our friends in IT, our friends over in financial aid, and find ways to get them the money to get these. Here at the university, we've had in the past a, you know, a laptop requirement. And so there have been folks who have used financial aid money to get you know, those, those pieces because it is part of the educational process now in higher education. Um, as I think about my friends in the you know, K-12 area, you know, access to broadband internet has become more has become easier, particularly in Brockton, because that's where I live now, thanks to Xfinity. I mean, they've done a great job with expanding their Wi-Fi hotspots to those, you know, f for folks to access. Good. Um, yeah. You know, and I think in the school systems now, they have more access to um, materials for I like I computers, um, mm -hmm. iPads, and things like that. But it's mm -hmm. still not where it should, should be. be. I'm glad to hear that you that financial aid and so forth, um, IT and financial aid are helping mm -hmm. students because they did uh, the Pell Grants and other um, opportunities provide money for books. Mm -hmm. So why would they not provide correct. it for computers? That I, is that's, correct. I just happened to think of that. So, yeah. well, you know, um, and there's another debate that goes on, and I'm wondering if this emphasis on digital technology is going to help or hinder, and that's all around testing, mm. the, uh, you know, the over testing that's been going on. Will the technology coming in now, will that change the way we evaluate students? I don't think so. I think, you know, the, the mandates that the state and, and the federal government have for state test or for, for testing our students, I, they don't really include technological education or, or fluency in using technology. Mm -hmm. Where I think we can make inroads in that outside of the standardized testing is, you know, having faculty, educators, um, in, infuse some part of technology as part of their assignments. So whether mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. you know, to the example you, you provided earlier in the show around um, spotting a fake, you know, how do, how do we teach them not only, you know, um, fluency and literacy for reading, but how do, can you tell digitally when a new story, the, the source is not, you know, up to snuff with another more credible news source mm -hmm. and taking the time to stop and instead of reacting to the news, ensuring that what you're consuming is actually from a reputable source. We need that for adults right now. <laughs> you absolutely are correct. And that's where social media gets a little challenging because people share information that may not necessarily be true, but, but it, it could be depending on your perspective or who wrote it mm -hmm. and, and the data they decided to pull to right. make the case. And I don't think young people, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think they read uh, traditional newspapers as much anymore, do they? They don't. I would say they will consume articles from, um, you know, from news sites online, online quickly. They'll scan mm -hmm. it if there's a video associated. What well, they, you know, they'll consume that at a faster rate. Mm -hmm. But you know, you'd be surprised when I talk to, you know, talk to our traditional age students again. They are informed. They 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 do mm -hmm. their homework and they are civically more engaged than previous generations oh. that I've worked with. So you know, the hope for me is that they they are taking more of a stand and, and you know, given, given the, the climate that our country is under now, I feel like that's a good thing for our mm -hmm. youth to be more engaged in that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this, that is a good point. I, as, as I listen to you, I can see that they do have access to what I read in the New York Times, but they, they can do it online. They do. True. Uh, now, in the business community, you know that they've been having a great influence on public education. And um, so there's been a big emphasis on STEM. They're saying we need workers that have more technological uh, skills. 
and STEM, the, they're emphasizing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Mm -hmm. Now, some of my friends and colleagues in the arts say it should be STEAM, science, technology, <laughs> engineering, the arts, and mathematics. Right. And certainly the arts connect to all the other um, <laughs> subjects or topics. Mm -hmm. So my question is, do you think, uh, especially where your wife's teaching in the lower grades, do you think that this stressing that we've been doing on STEM, we've been right through early grades, all the way through high school, do you think that's helping higher education institutions to put more investment into technology because they know that the students are coming up with this emphasis on STEM? So yes, I think it's a double-edged sword. So on one hand, yes, we have more students coming here with that interest and wanting to pursue, particularly around you know students who want to do coding for robotics and technology. Mm. You know the folks who are um, you know in our science building, you know looking at the different ways they explore the sciences. The, the but what's what's challenging now because of that push on STEM is that lack of writing skills that we see coming in. So now yes. when a student enters the institution, their writing skills, their, um, you know, the way they deduce problems and go through a problem solving that, you know, Angela Duckworth talked about in her research about grit, around mm -hmm. being able yes. to overcome yes. adversity, that has become more of a challenge for our colleagues in, in the classroom and outside the classroom because their writing is just not as strong as it was just five or ten years ago. Now you're talking about writing the content. Correct. But what has happened, they no longer teach penmanship at all. That's correct. That's and yep. uh, everybody prints now mm -hmm. and you have to print mighty fast if you're at a lecture somewhere. And um, I'm curious because one little girl, uh, someone told me this, she said she gave her granddaughter or someone a card and she said I can't read this I don't read the cursive oh wow and I was pretty shocked by that so just go moving back from the content of how they write mm -hmm. but the actual just always having a pencil in your hand they always have a digital and many of these students are not taught how to type right I was a commercial student in New York City and then took enough to go on to college mm -hmm. enough of the you know academics but um, we were we could type now they have to hunt and peck, which number one, takes up so much time, right. and number two, does take away from any opportunity to write mm -hmm. with, with a pencil or a pen. Yep. And I just wonder um, you know, how this is all affecting our students with not being able to express and communicate their thoughts in a, in a healthy way, you know, in an a, a acceptable way. I mean, people who don't know how to use embedded phrases and, and all the kinds of things yep. students used to be able to do. So how are they, are they doing anything to help with I that? I think so, yeah. I mean, my both my girls are in elementary and um, my 11-year-old has started showing me the writing that they're starting to do more in school that didn't oh. wasn't there earlier. So they are doing still a little bit of the... What grade uh, is that? Uh, fifth grade. Fifth grade. Fifth grade. Fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And my youngest who's in third grade is also showing some signs of writing. And I know that in the high school in Brockton, I can't speak for other mm -hmm. communities. No, I'm, that's a good I, example, I, I'm, though. I'm pretty sure in the high school they're teaching typing as part of the curriculum mm -hmm. there. I'd have to verify that. That would be an, yeah, pretty unusual, but it's Yeah, because, a good thing. because I know that once they arrive here, they're, you're using their laptops mostly to get their work done. Mm -hmm. And I don't see many of our students, and maybe it's a natural progression as they get to, get to use the, you know, the keyboard. I think I've seen reporters who are you know experienced and doing they this. just have the two <laughs> fingers going like 100 miles an hour. Oh my goodness. So I guess it's less important than I think because I took typing. You know, again, the, the old ideas and the new mm -hmm. and um, we, we flow together. Along the way here, we don't have too much time left, but we, we mentioned, I think you mentioned early on the word soft skills. Yeah. And um, digital people and people in science um, are not always thinking, and it's sort of related to this writing and the humanities and reading, writing, and expressing oneself. Sure. Um, but I hear business people saying that we need soft skills, people who can cooperate. Would you, would you speak to how that works with the digital technology? I, I think it's a balancing act. I think it's le around leadership. I think you know our students need to know when to put the devices down and when to focus on the person that's in front of them. <laughs> I think there's a time and place to use these digital tools. I think we've gone too far down one end to use it all the time versus you know, turning it off and, you know, really spending time with one another. I think when you hire a new 
you know, let's say Bridgewater State graduate, you want them to be able not only to do their work, but to make that work meaningful through the relationships they make at work. And so I think it's time for many of us to role model the behavior that we expect from our staff and our, our colleagues with digital technology where why are we responding to emails on the weekend? Why are we, you know, un unless it's an em emergency, and I know an emergency, you're gonna pick up the phone and call me if it's a true emergency, <laughs> you right. know, but we have overinflated our own use of this technology for self-importance. So I think that's part of the soft skills is recognizing what the tools are. And I equate it to, instead of saying, these are digital tools, I, I call them digital instruments. Because an instrument requires practice, it requires you know, a cleaning up of the tool every once in a while, depending on what kind of tool it is. Mm -hmm. And the more tools you know, and the more tools you put together in a collaborative approach, the, no, the, more, the be more beautiful the music. And so you know, I want us to move more to that metaphor of these digital technology pieces, as opposed mm -hmm. to calling them tools that fix a problem. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. Well, that, that's a, a healthy and a, a great explanation of it. And I think your first phrase, I like that, a balancing act. And it is, depending on where you are in your life and how skilled you are with it that's all. Right. But I just am not very happy when people all get together. And I know I'm ready to say when we have parties for my grandchildren and, you know, the family, I feel like putting a basket at the door saying, drop your, you know, your <laughs> digital stuff here. We have just about a minute left. So just very briefly, what would you say is your greatest frustration or your greatest reason for optimism or a quick word on both, whatever you wish? Well, I think it's, well, I'll do both. So quickly, um, I'm frustrated that we haven't figured out a way to formalize the education that we give our students around technology. And whether it's a class or whether it's embedded into the pedagogy, I think we need to do a better job with that. And uh, my optimism is with this generation of students. The more I work with them and the more I get to know them, I have high hopes that they will lead us in, in, into the future with how to best use these tools. Thank you so much. You've been so helpful, Dr. Cabellan. And Bridgewater State University is very lucky to have you. Oh, very kind. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Um, in closing, I'm going to use a quote that I found from Dr. Cabellan. And he quoted in this speech from a colleague of his called D.T. Henry. And I was pretty impressed. So I'm going to share that quote. Every wireless connection ties back to a wire. Digital technology is not meant to replace face-to-face, -face, but a bridge to bring people together in a way that is meaningful and adds value to education. That's truly student-centered technological school talk.